Good evening. I'm Jim Duff, the Executive Director of the Supreme Court Historical Society, and it's my honor to welcome you to our virtual platform for tonight's lecture. The Society was founded in 1974 by then Chief Justice Warren Burger to improve public understanding about the Supreme Court, the Constitution, and the judiciary. One of the elements of the Society that we've utilized uh, has been our lectures on the court's history and its justices. Since the start of the COVID pandemic, we have uh, moved to the Zoom format, and we plan to continue these virtual events even when we can return to in-person programming. If you've missed an earlier program, please visit the Society's YouTube page to watch them. We think you will enjoy them. Tonight's lecture is on Frederick Douglass. I hope I'm not stealing any thunder from our great speaker tonight to note that yesterday, Valentine's Day, was the day that Frederick Douglass picked as his birthday following his escape from enslavement, as the date of his actual birth was unknown. The Washington Post noted, after he got his freedom, he celebrated St. Valentine's Day as his birthday since he felt he had as good a right to have a birthday as other people, and he liked the traditions surrounding that date. So happy belated birthday to Frederick Douglass. Our speaker this evening is Bradley Rivero. He is an associate professor of law at Brigham Young University Law School. He earned a BA from Brigham Young University, as well as a JD from BYU Law and a PhD in political science from the University of Notre Dame. Professor Ribeiro's research ranges from US constitutional history to comparative constitutional inquiries. He has published and has articles forthcoming in top journals, such as the Notre Dame Law Review and the Brigham Young Law Review. He researches the philosophy of law as well as the influence of political thought on constitutional jurisprudence. His book manuscript, Natural Rights Reconstruction, Frederick Douglass and Constitutional Abolitionism, investigates the constitutional thought of Frederick Douglass and its influence in the antebellum period and during Reconstruction. He is currently on leave from BYU to serve as a law clerk to Judge John K. Bush, the judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, uh, the circuit in which I was raised. Uh, professor, uh, welcome. And uh, the Society's virtual floor is all yours. We look forward to your remarks this evening and we'll take audience questions uh, around in about 35 minutes into the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim, for the introduction. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Supreme Court Historical Society for inviting me to speak today, and uh, particularly to uh, Jennifer Lowe for helping organizing all the logistics. Um, now I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I apologize in advance because when we were sort of troubleshooting to start, we could not get the PowerPoint to work uh, as it should. So I can't put it in PowerPoint presentation, but you'll be able to see all the slides. Um, Hopefully that's good enough. And at the very least, you don't have to see my face, uh, which should be a benefit. Uh, so Frederick Douglass, uh, he's the topic of tonight's conversation. Uh, and he lived a remarkable life. He was a former slave turned act activist turned statesman. Though Douglass is well known, it never hurts uh, to remind it of his remarkable journey from slavery to freedom and maintain that narrative as a backdrop to the inevitable, uh, the invaluable contributions that he made to the rebirth of a nation and to the freedom of a people who long suffered under the weight of oppression. Frederick Douglass was born into slavery sometime around February of 1817. And just as we learned, we don't actually know what date that was, um, in part because he couldn't tell you himself and records concerning the enslaved simply were not a priority. Uh, and Douglass, he toiled under various slaveholders, uh, some more cruel than others. Uh, eventually he found himself in Maryland under a certain Thomas Auld. Uh, where he first received lessons to read from Thomas Auld's wife, uh, but Auld later instructed her not to continue to teach Douglas uh, because it would make him unfit for servitude. Well, Douglas agreed, and having the insatiable mind that he did, continued to learn in secret and eventually devised a plan that would take him to the North. Uh, 
Escaping to the North was on the minds of many of the enslaved uh, in the South. The received wisdom was, if I can make it to the North, there I'll be free. There I will know what it means to live and to know the eternal principle and truth that all men are created equal, that they have certain inalienable rights, and among them being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately for Douglas, many of his brethren were unable to find their way to the North, and he soon came to find that the promise of the Declaration was still on that next horizon. Well, Douglas was uh, quickly roped into the abolitionist movement as he did find some friends, uh, including William Lloyd Garrison, one of the most preeminent uh, abolitionists of the time. Now, the Garrisonians were adamant that the Constitution was a, quote, government with death in agreement with hell. And just as well, Douglas thought. After all, he experienced firsthand the evil of slavery. And any constitution that permitted it, or perhaps even facilitated its perpetuation, could not claim the allegiance of any man or woman uh, with a conscience. What was more, the North was not quite the haven that Blacks hoped it would be. Though there was some progress in sundry areas, uh, the vast majority of the white North remained skeptical of the prospect of living equally alongside Blacks, even if they adamantly opposed slavery. In many states, cities and municipalities, Blacks did not enjoy equal civil rights, let alone political rights. And after 1850, virtually everywhere in the US uh, was unsafe for Blacks after the passing of the Second Fugitive Slave Act. This act was more devastating than its predecessor as Blacks were not allowed to give testimony on their own behalf if accused of being a slave and judges were now incentivized through additional money if they returned verdicts that found the accused Black of being a fugitive slave. These conditions are what led Douglas to eventually free, flee the US for England, where the realization of the plight of Blacks became even more pronounced for him. In England, though not perfect, Douglas realized and found that the color of skin mattered less than it did there than it did in the States. He even found that he was treated with equal dignity and respect in some places, something he was loath to find in the US. While in England, Douglas began to study topics in philosophy and law, including the Scottish and British Enlightenment. During this time, Douglas began to rethink his understanding of the Constitution and the US. It was here that he first began to think about what it would mean to have a more inclusive United States and the possibilities that the Constitution provided to make that inclusivity a reality. Douglas was able to return from England when some close friends pulled together funds to purchase his freedom. And upon his return, Douglas no longer hunt, was hunted down by slave catchers. He was a free man, not only in fact, but in law as well. Not, only, not long after Douglas returned from England, he announced in his newspaper that he had a change of opinion concerning the Constitution. No longer was it this covenant of death in agreement with hell. He stated, quote, my new circumstances compelled me to rethink the whole subject and to study with some care, not only the just and proper rules of legal interpretation, but the origin, design, nature, rights, powers, and duties of civil governments, and also the relations which human beings sustain to it, end quote. After a careful study of political philosophy and law, Douglas determined that the Constitution was in fact a glorious liberty document. When executed properly, the Constitution would eradicate slavery, er, slavery everywhere in the Union. But even more, the Constitution would protect the rights, privileges, and immunities of all US citizens regardless of race, color, or creed. Douglas came to this robust understanding of what it meant to be a US citizen. In it contained the promise of equality and freedom for all blacks. For Douglas understood blacks to not only be deserving of citizenship, but he believed that the fate of African Americans was inextricably intertwined with the US. But one might fairly ask, how is this so? While black citizenship in antebellum America was always a point of contention, and difficulty in, since the nation's founding, we might say the crisis of black citizenship uh, really began with Dred Scott. Dred Scott, a former slave uh, from Missouri, pictured on your left, uh, sued on the theory that traveling to Wisconsin territory made him a free man. The Supreme Court, however, ruled that Dred Scott was not a citizen and therefore did not have standing. In fact, Justice Taney, who authored the majority opinion, claimed that according to the original understanding of the Constitution, Blacks were never intended to be part of the original compact and therefore could never be citizens. 
This was the age in which blacks had no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. To understand what, but to understand what Douglas envisioned uh, when he described the future of America as a mutually shared fate of all races, we have to understand what he saw in constitutional citizenship. For Douglas, the Constitution's first words, in a sense, said it all: "We, the people." Douglas noticed that noted that we the people was quite different from we the white people or we the citizens or even we the legal voters. The framers, they could have chosen a more restrictive language, a more restrictive set of uh, words, but they chose not to for two reasons. First, the constitution was not meant only for the few favored few in the union in 1787. The constitution contemplating adding to its citizenry all those uh, who constituted the people within the geographic boundaries of the United States. Second, the Constitution contemplated an increase in citizens. Regardless of how restricted the initial number of citizens would be, the Constitution contemplates the addition of more that will be full participants and beneficiaries of the Constitution's duties and promises, whether that be through birth or through naturalization. The great aim of the Constitution was to secure the blessings of liberty for the ratifiers and for all those who came after. Douglas's theory of constitutional citizenship closely followed his understanding of the nature of government and the concomitant nature of citizenship or membership in a political community. This theory was crit critical to both the plight of the enslaved in the South as well as free blacks in the North. If they were to have a future, they must embrace and advocate the idea of citizenship, which carries the blessings of rights guarantees, but also carries the burden of oath keeping. And whites also needed to embrace Douglas's theory of citizenship. Though they did not face the same existential crisis that blacks did, Douglas believed that no government could long stand if it made a mockery of the basic duties that it owed to its people. And as will be clarified, a threat to liberties of any was quite literally and figuratively a threat to all. Whites who came to understand the true nature of government and the promises of the Constitution, uh, and the promises the Constitution provided would then come to understand that the plight of African Americans was in a way the plight of all Americans. As Lincoln put it in his Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address, the great test for Americans in the Civil War, and by extension, the question of the future of slavery, was whether a nation dedicated to the proposition that all men were created equal could long endure. There were several critical questions that Douglas had to answer to solidify this notion of African American citizenship in a community beset by ubiquitous oppression. What are the grounds for claiming citizenship in a political community? What are the benefits of citizenship? On what grounds, if any, may political community exclude individuals from claiming either citizenship, the benefits of it, or both? What sense did it make to stake out any sort of claim for black citizenship, citizenship in the US? These are questions that struck at the heart of Frederick Douglass's great project to procure the full emancipation of millions of enslaved blacks in the, in the US. Full emancipation meant more than merely breaking the chains of the enslaved. Blacks needed to be free in every sense of the term. True freedom required slaveholders to free their slaves, but also that the entire political community uh, free the same of all impositions that prevented slaves from enjoying the full gamut of privileges and immunities of citizenship within that community. It was for this reason that Douglas would emphatically state to the American Anti-Slavery Society after the ratification of the 13th Amendment that the work simply was not done. So to answer these questions, we'll first explore Douglas's moral account of governance based on natural law theory. And second, we will consider Douglas's understanding of the two essential components of citizenship, namely rights and duties. Traditional social contract theory offers an account of human beings as originating in the state of nature where they enjoyed a perfect state of freedom. Each person could, according to the laws of nature, pursue his or her individual interests without interference from others. But in the state of nature, human beings were fundamentally isolated and disconnected. They had no responsibilities to others, except for not encroaching on one another's rights. But this state of nature would not last long as conflict would inevitably arise, causing people in close proximity to come together and form government for the sake of a common unbiased judge and executioner that would ensure that everyone could enjoy their natural rights in peace. Such an account was fine, at least as far as it went. It served as the backdrop to the Declaration of Independence, which served to spur people toward independence and with time 
served Blacks in their quest for first for freedom from servitude and second for equal citizenship. But as much as Douglas lauded this political theory, he had certain modifications he would introduce over time. The most glaring problem, according to Douglas, was the isolatedness of individuals, an isolation that led each person seeking after their own interests without regard for others. In this, the sense was, as long as I do not infringe on the rights of others, I have no obligation to others. If the rights of others were being infringed or violated in some way, that simply was the job of the government to resolve. In Douglas's view, this sentiment plagued the North during the antebellum era. He lamented the general apathy of Northerners who felt no real sense of duty or obligation to those enslaved in the South. The thought was, well, I'm not holding any slaves. So long as the North remains free and vile of the institution, or, or free of the vile institution, we've done our part. Predominant anti-slavery constitutional thought fit this ethos. The constitution did not protect slavery any more than it sought to abolish it. Slavery was to remain in the states where it existed and go no further. Accordingly, the slogan, slavery local, freedom national, was adopted by the Liberty Party, which was a precursor to the Republican Party, which in turn was the party of Lincoln, and that same party was the one that contrived the Reconstruction Amendments. But for Douglas, if the Constitution was to mean something, it had to, insist, it had to assist in the efforts to end slavery. So having determined that so, traditional social contract theory was inadequate to address the plight of slaves in the South, Douglas provided a revised theory of government, one that was faithful to the Enlightenment, but carried certain modifications that would impose a more robust theory of rights and duties that could aid the slave in the South, as well as otherwise oppressed Blacks in the North. First, Douglas posits that, quote, man is a social as well as individual being, that he is endowed by his creator with faculties and power suited to his individuality and to society. Well, so far so good. Like the Enlightenment, human beings are endowed with certain powers and rights that make them fit to govern themselves. But Douglas adds a new principle, quote, second, that individual isolation is unnatural, unprogressive, and against the highest interests of man, and that society is required by the natural wants and necessities inherent in human existence, end quote. Now society is no longer a consequence of the breaking down of the state of nature. Society is the natural end of human beings. We want to come together to form political communities because it fulfills the highest interests of man. Therefore, there's a sort of mutual dependence and accountability among members of the community. It would not be enough to simply refrain from violating others' rights. In a sense, we have a duty now to ensure the rights of our fellow human beings. We can see a similar sentiment in Martin Luther King's uh, famous pronouncement, quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, end quote. But how does one become a member of, the, of this said community? Well, the notion of forming a political community implies that some will be in and others will be out. And Douglas admits this, claiming that a community coming together to govern itself is natural and, desi is natural and desirable. Communities will naturally form in a geographic region uh, or location and will set rules that seem best to fit for governing themselves. And they'll exclude others in this process. Uh, but those others ostensibly can form their own communities with their own laws as they see fit. But Douglas faced the problem of Dred Scott. Justice Tommy, remember, declared that Blacks could not be citizens in the US. And what was more, Blacks did not have rights that white men were bound to respect. Well, that could theoretically fit Douglas's own premise. But Douglas, Douglas's claim for Blacks still had two points. First, the Declaration of Independence set the standard for freedom and the Constitution set the standard for citizenship. The Declaration stood for the proposition that all were created equal. This, Douglas believed, was America's first Constitution. The Constitution, when it stated we the people, included all the people within the geographic region that was the United States. Thus, Blacks, along with their whites, were included in this promise. But when, when addressing the concern that the framers surely could not have intended that slaves be included in that preamble, Douglas conceded as much, but only for slaves. He maintained, once free, slaves would take on the full status of freemen and would therefore enjoy all the promises that the Constitution had to offer, 
So in a sense, this is a, was a concession to a, what one might call pro-slavery vision of the constitution, but only a minor one. In Douglass's mind, the constitution would operate to eradicate slavery everywhere in the union in due time. Thus, even if some blacks uh, were not citizens at the time of ratification, all would eventually become citizens. So once we're now citizens, what are the benefits that it, the constitution provides them? Or put differently, what exactly was the content of justice and the blessings of liberty that the Constitution promised? Douglas believed that the Constitution provided all persons, regardless of citizenship, security in their inalienable natural rights, namely life, liberty, and property. As for citizens, the Constitution further promised a host of civil rights that were in some respects natural and in other respects necessary to facilitate human beings' natural liberty. These rights we might term privileges and immunities of US citizenship. After the plight of the slave, it was this category that was the most pressing for blacks in the antebellum period. Privileges and immunities entailed all rights guaranteed in the original articles of the constitution, such as for, uh, freedom from bills of attainder, the guarantee of comedy among the states uh, in recognizing citizens as proper rights bearers, uh, regardless of the state he or she hails from, and it included the Bill of Rights. Blacks face rights deprivations, nevertheless, in many states and localities in a variety of ways. Anywhere from depriving the basic benefits uh, of public accommodations to outright barring entry to some states. But perhaps the most sensational deprivation of rights that free Blacks face was the result of the Seaman Acts. Southern states, partly in retaliation against Northern liberty laws, passed rather stringent laws concerning the mobility of Black seamen. While Northern ships were docked at Southern ports, blacks, black men were detained in prison. And typically blacks would be charged for their imprisonment. And when they were unable to pay the fees were sold into servitude to cover the costs. Douglas joined petitions to Congress to remedy the situation, most importantly invoking article four and the privileges and immunities of US citizenship. By virtue of their citizenship, the argument went, blacks enjoyed the right to travel and comedy principles required Southern states to honor that right. Douglas made clear the length he would go in advocating for black rights when he stated, quote, I shall advocate for the Negro his most full and complete adoption into the great national family of America. I shall demand for him the most perfect civil and political equality, and that he shall enjoy all the rights, privileges, and immunities enjoyed by any other members of the body politic, end quote. Whatever rights the Constitution provided, it provided them on an equal basis. The Constitution knew no difference concerning the status of citizens. When it came to government, Douglas stated, quote, in this department of human relations, no notice should be taken of the color of men, but justice, wisdom, and humanity alone should weigh, should weigh alone and be all controlling, end quote. Though all laws discriminate between actions and people on some basis, that basis had to be rational. The basis was rational if it was morally rational. In the category to comport uh, had to comport with some measure or understanding of the natural law, which saw humans in a perfect state of equality and freedom, accountable to their deeds. Laws that comported with the natural law were rational, while discriminating based on categories which human beings cannot be made to morally account for, such as the color of one's skin, was the height of irrationality. Such laws, in a sense, were no laws at all. In this regard, Douglas was not entirely alone. Many white anti-slavery advocates similarly sought not only the emancipation of slaves, but also equal civil rights for their black compatriots. For instance, when Congress failed to act when Southern states imprisoned flag, uh, free black seamen, Massachusetts went so far as to send an envoy, Samuel Orr, to South Carolina to seek the release of the imprisoned. Though it did not end well for Orr as he was literally run out of town after the South Carolina legislature called for his expulsion. But as the Civil War drew to a close, Congress set its sights on the complete abolition of slavery through the 13th Amendment. From there, they turned their uh, eyes toward securing civil rights for the, through the, 15th, the 14th Amendment. But this was a sore point of political contention. But we should note that Douglas was largely dismissive of, dismissive of debates surrounding the 14th Amendment. This is somewhat surprising given the great importance of this amendment. After all, it overturned Dred Scott putting beyond question the fact that freedmen were now citizens and that they did have rights that white men were bound to respect. 
We might glean from this, however, that at least for Republicans, guaranteeing black civil rights, black civil rights uh, was a settled matter. But Douglas's contribution to dialogues concerning the 14th Amendment were generally limited to one observation, that that amendment was not enough. And it was deficient for one reason and one reason only. It did not grant blacks equal political rights. Even in the North, the sense was, yes, let's grant the enslaved everywhere their God-given natural right to freedom. It was not fit for men to be slaves, nor for others to be masters. Every person was entitled to life, liberty, and property, to own their own labor, to seek their own fortunes, free from the tyrannical and oppressive rule of other men. But this freedom did not necessarily entail the right to participate politically in society. That was left for the privileged few who had the knowledge and could act in a manner that would provide for the common good of all. But Douglas came to a very different conclusion on this matter. It was because man was free that he had political rights. And it was the right to vote in many ways that separated human beings from other animals. Their ability to reason and choose right over wrong gave them the natural capacity to vote. Following Douglas's logic, even before the Reconstruction Amendments were ratified, the guarantee of equal privileges and immunities uh, that was promised to all citizens uh, could in some ways entail the right to vote if you follow this natural rights logic. Well, one might be able to come to that conclusion uh, and that at least for all citizens where a state or a locality granted the right to vote, it simply could not discriminate on an irrational basis such as race or sex. Well, the 14th Amendment solidified civil rights, but it complicated political rights. The plain natural reading of section one which guaranteed the privileges or immunities of US citizens against state abridgment, again, could have followed this sort of constitutional interpretation that Douglas would have suggested, reading in the right to vote. But section two complicated matters. Its plain reading provided the possibility that states could abridge the right to vote for males over the age of 21. Though it imposed a penalty for doing so, it provided a back door for states to deny blacks the right to vote. And between 1865 and 1866, we find many states doubled down in their opposition to black suffrage. Among Northern states, for instance, uh, five jurisdictions, including Wisconsin, Minnesota, and DC, voted against referenda that would have granted blacks voting rights. For these reasons, though the possibility of black suffrage may have been divine through constitutional interpretation, Douglas believed that nothing short of express language in a new amendment could actually grant the black to vote uh, blacks the right to vote and protect it. And Douglas expended all of his efforts in this singular cause. Well, ultimately those efforts were rewarded with the ratification of the 15th Amendment. In his words, quote, we live, we henceforth live in a new world, breathe a new atmosphere, have a new earth beneath and a new sky above us. We were always men, now we are citizens and men among men. Up to this point, I've discussed Douglas's theory citizenship how the Constitution encompasses the notion of African American citizenship and the promises that that citizenship carries with it. But there was another equally important facet to Douglas's theory of citizenship, allegiance. According to Douglas, citizenship carried with it the duty of allegiance to the community. Inasmuch as the political community promised to protect and preserve the citizen's rights, that citizen in return had to promise to protect and preserve the political community. There were two facets to this allegiance abiding laws and protecting the rights of others. The most fundamental covenant citizens made was to uphold the rule of law. Citizens abided by the rule of the majority because of several basic assumptions. First, Douglas believed that men were essentially good and therefore majorities would more often pass just laws than unjust ones. Second, government is limited. Its power to adopt laws that obliges its citizens does not extend to laws that violate natural rights and happiness of human beings. Third, somewhat paradoxically, citizens must accept some of society's laws that are against their best interests, since individuals at the end of the day don't always choose what's actually in their best interest. For the sake of union, therefore, citizens must tolerate laws that they may fundamentally disagree with, so long as those laws did not violate inalienable natural rights. The second part of the covenant was to protect the rights of others and the Civil War presented Blacks the opportunity, to do, the opportunity to do so. Douglas pushed incessantly for the inclusion of Blacks in the war effort, but two main impediments stood in his way. First and foremost, Abraham Lincoln and his administration were reluctant to make war one of emancipation. 
At the start of the war, Lincoln's number one objective was restoring the nation. Early in the war, he reassured Southerners that the Union did not mean the end of slavery, and at times backed his words up with commands, such as having his general, Fremont, return slaves freed in the war effort. Second, Lincoln and his administration were hesitant to enlist free Blacks in the cause. This was likely connected to the first impediment. To enlist Blacks in the, in the Union Army would surely incense the South and give the impression that the war was meant to free all slaves, even if Lincoln never intended to do so. But it also had to do with public sentiment. Listen, once Lincoln was eventually ready to actually enlist Blacks, his army likely wasn't ready for it, let alone the general populace. For these reasons, Douglas was quite critical of Lincoln early on in the war effort, but he still admonished his black brothers to prepare themselves for battle. He encouraged blacks to, quote, drink as deeply into the martial spirit of the times as possible, end quote, including organizing themselves and purchasing and learning how to use firearms. Blacks needed to be ready for the moment that they would be called to arms when the reciprocal agreement had a promise of being fulfilled. To that end, once, emancipation, once the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, Douglas redoubled his efforts. His admonition was stark and carried across the nation, men of color to arms. In his call to arms, Douglas listed several reasons for why blacks should enlist. First, there was a moral duty to defend right against wrong. It was the lot of all human beings to discern between right and wrong and act accordingly. Second, belonging to a community required the individual to share the same fate of that community. Third, referring to the covenant of citizenship, if Blacks showed a full commitment to the community, the community in turn must do the same for them. Though a reciprocal agreement, it was clear that Blacks needed to prove their white, to their white counterparts that they were just as deserving of the blessings of liberty, thus highlighting the tension between American ideals and its actual practices. Finally, even if the community failed to honor its end of the bargain, Blacks would do well to enlist and learn to fight, for there was an intrinsic value in doing so. If the community could either could not or refused to protect the rights of Blacks, it would be up to Blacks to defend their own rights. The first political community for Blacks was the Union. But if all hope of being part of that community would break down, then their only option was each other. Uh, Douglas stated, quote, when it is seen that Black men no more than white men can be enslaved with impunity, men will be less inclined to enslave and oppress them. Enlist, therefore, that you may learn the art and assert the ability to defend yourself and your race. End quote. Put differently, once the carrot was exhausted, one must use the stick. But why would Douglas focus so much on the duties of Blacks uh, that they owe to a political community that all too often did not uphold its own end of the bargain? Well, as mentioned earlier, uh, Douglas believed Blacks needed to convince others of their valor in the war and their contributions to society and that they were on equal footing with their white peers. Though unfair in, though unfair in many levels, uh, Douglas was not naive in his pursuit of African-American citizenship. True and just principles, though universal, must still be applied in local settings. One must take account of what is in considering what could be. A more pressing and practical problem, however, was the calls for emigration. In the 1850s, uh, there was a growing concern in the North associated with increasing Black populations. As committed to the, as the North was to anti-slavery efforts, a substantial portion were concerned what abolition would mean for their communities. Even if they did not wish to see Blacks enslaved or treated unfairly before the law, this did not mean that they necessarily wished for Blacks to become members of their own political communities. Even more problematic, a growing problem, a growing number of Blacks in the U.S. also began considering colonization to be a viable option. But Douglas did not mince words concerning immigration. He referred to the spirit of colonization as satanic. Colonizationists were wolves in sheep's clothing. They would clothe their program in terms of liberating Blacks from oppression and seeking Blacks flourishing in freedom, but in reality, they were feeding popular prejudice and hindering the possibility of Black citizenship. Blacks in turn needed to reject calls for colonization because their allegiance belonged to the Union and not to some supposed land of origin. One's allegiance to a political community figured more prominently, prominently than, the, than the tribe from which that individual came. In other words, one's conventional community mattered more than one's natural community. True, Doug, Douglas believed that Blacks needed to resort to their own communities in the event that the Union completely ousted them from their rightful place within. 
but that option was called for only after the political community broke down. This, in some respects, would be an exercise in the right of revolution, akin to the founders. In closing, understanding antebellum views of political community, rights, privileges, and duties can help remind us of the first principles of government, which in turn can aid us in our quest for ensuring a more inclusive community dedicated to, to securing the blessings of liberty and justice for us and our posterity. We are simultaneously reminded that we are part of one great project that began at the nation's founding and of the fact that that project remains incomplete today. Even when times were darkest, when the nation was torn asunder, Douglas looked forward with hope. So long as the principles of the decoration enshrined in the constitution remain the country's lodestar, no matter how far from the shore we drifted, we always knew there was a way home. And Douglas always hoped that we would reach that shore. And he referred to his hope as a rational one. It was one forged with knowledge and experience, grounded in a natural rights theory of justice. There was always one thing Douglas was certain of when speaking of the future of black citizenship. He stated, quote, we are here and are here to stay. It is well for us and well for the American people to rest upon this as final. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. It's a fascinating recitation of uh, history and uh, Frederick Douglass's enormous impact. Uh, we, we are accepting questions from um, our audience. And as we as those come in, I uh, would kick it off with a couple of my own. Um, it, it's amendments to our constitution are hard to get under the best of circumstances and uh, very difficult to achieve. Uh, it's why we have so few uh, in our constitution. Um, I think the founders uh, made it um, uh, somewhat challenging. And as you compare our constitution to others around the world, um, which have uh, in, in some circumstances, many uh, amendments uh, by comparison to ours, how did Frederick Douglass uh, mobilize and who were his allies to get, for example, the 14th Amendment uh, passed? I know his, it, it, he was held in such high regard, but can you give us a little sense of uh, his political um, acumen and, and uh, you know, how, how he helped uh, shape that amendment and get it passed? Yeah, certainly. Um, so that was actually one of the more curious points in uh, researching Douglas and uh, sort of his history within Reconstruction, almost how little he had to say about the 14th Amendment. It was almost as if Douglas believed, well, the 14th Amendment is in good hands. Uh, but the problem he saw, and sort of as I mentioned, was this problem of political rights. Uh, mm -hmm. He noticed the, the glaring issue of the 14th Amendment was that it not only did not grant political rights, but that it expressly provided a way that states could abridge those rights, right, for their own citizens. Uh, so at this time, when the 14th Amendment is uh, being considered, uh, Douglas is actually sort of riding circuit around the U.S., uh, pleading with Republicans to consider another amendment for voting rights specifically. And then as far as uh, who he was sort of galvanizing, actually, there's a lot of uh, Southern loyalty, loyalists. Because uh, another interesting aspect at this time, even though uh, Republican senators and congressmen from the North uh, did not want to entertain the idea of Black suffrage, they were very more than willing to grant Blacks the right to vote in the South, right? Uh, so they passed the Reconstruction Acts, uh, and these acts uh, allow for Blacks to participate in new constitution formation, um, as well as other uh, political endeavors, uh, right? They can, they can exercise their right to vote, for instance, in 1868, when Grant is going up in the presidency, and Douglas uh, is going all throughout the South, encouraging and almost forcing Blacks to vote, saying, you need to take this chance. You need to vote right now. Um, and then once they vote, they actually come out in droves. And in a lot of ways, some might even say that President Grant, would he have won over Richard Seymour, who was sort of the Southern representative, uh, if Blacks weren't voting at that time? And Douglas harped on this consistently and sort of wrote this as he push for the 15th Amendment. Uh, but yeah, you, you find him um, all throughout uh, the North and the South uh, focused on voting rights. Um, and as, as you mentioned, you know, he's a prominent figure at this time. So, so everyone really is concerned with what he has to say. Uh, 
Did did, uh, did he have much of a personal relationship with uh, President Lincoln and others who promoted uh, the abolitionist movement? Uh, he did, and even before, both before the start of the Civil War and during the Civil War, he's exchanging letters with them. Um, and so Lincoln's actually quite interesting because uh, his interactions with Lincoln only came after, uh, in his papers, uh, he owned a newspaper called the Frederick Douglass paper. Uh, and in this paper, he's constantly writing articles, uh, lambasting Abraham Lincoln, right, and his policies. Uh, and Abraham Lincoln, at some point, recognizing even at this time, uh, Douglas is quite the prominent figure and people are listening to what he has to say, he decides I need to get this man uh, in the Oval Office, I need to talk to him and that's where their relationship begins. Um, and so what started out as animus became a really strong friendship between the two. Um, in fact, Douglas, when he's reminiscing on Abraham Lincoln, he has this uh, poignant moment where he says, uh, the only time in the United States when he truly felt that he wasn't made to feel the co color of his skin was when he met with Abraham Lincoln. Mm, interesting. <clears throat> how long How long did he live? Give, give us a little bit of, uh, more of a biography of, of Frederick Douglass uh, uh, in, in, in post-Civil War uh, uh, era. Um, sorry, so you just wanna know like what, what sort of happened after? Yes, after, yes. Yeah, yeah, so after the Civil War, um, Douglass is obviously, deeply engaged in, uh, in sort of the reconstructing of the nation, right? Mm -hmm. So he's deeply concerned as far as uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are concerned. And then he's, you know, very much engaged in reconstruction itself. Uh, so for instance, uh, the Freedmen's Bureau Bank, unfortunately, when it was almost to the point of uh, dying, he, they, the nation calls upon Douglas to try to fix it. And he actually invests thousands of his own dollars uh, to try to save this bank. The whole point of the bank was to provide an opportunity for Blacks to invest, uh, but also to borrow and to loan money um, so that they could sort of kickstart their lives because they had essentially nothing. Um, but unfortunately, that was an endeavor that failed ultimately. Uh, but from there, Douglas uh, continued to then push not only for Black rights, and he's deeply concerned about um, the advent of Jim Crow and the like, uh, but he's also concerned about uh, the rights of others as well, such as uh, women's voting rights. So at the time of the Reconstruction, um, Douglas, in a lot of ways, had to sort of cabin the idea of women's rights because the nation simply wasn't quite ready for the idea of expanding the vote to uh, two new sets of people or groups of people, let alone one. Uh, so he had to sort of cabin that. But as soon as the 15th Amendment is passed, we find that Douglas is taking pen to paper again and advocating for women's rights, women's suffrage. Um, and in fact, one of his dying acts was actually uh, going to attending a women's rights convention, right? And he's reenacting uh, this convention to his wife. And, and at that time, he died of a heart attack. Uh, so you find that all throughout his life, literally up until the very end, that Douglas is, he never stops, right? He's always continually pushing for that next horizon and justice or progress towards equality. Did he have uh, um, a more vocal role in supporting the 19th Amendment? Um, and it was is that support consistent with his views and actions with respect to the 14th Amendment? 19th uh, Amendment being the right to vote. Yeah, for what, right, uh, or for all, I guess you could say that. Um, yeah, I, I would say so. Uh, and this is somewhat a point of contention because some believe that a uh, uh, Douglas and others who advocated for Black suffrage, sort of as I'm mentioning, uh, as they sort of cabin the question of uh, women's rights and women's suffrage, were implicitly arguing that they didn't deserve the right to vote, or that their right to vote somehow wasn't based on the same terms of natural rights and equality. Uh, but Douglas was quite clear in this point. And remember when I mentioned, um, Douglas realized that whenever you're pushing for let's say that next step in justice or the next step in securing equal rights, you always have to be cognizant of what is. And Douglas was quite cognizant of that. So in his understanding, even though natural rights required that not only blacks, uh, but women as well deserve the right to vote, he was very cognizant of the America he was living in and that there simply wasn't a palette or a taste for expanding those voting rights beyond. So I would say, even if, as you're looking through some of his speeches, 
Uh, if you look at the Equal Rights Conventions, you'll notice a lot of contention, uh, particularly with uh, Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, but as you do that, just keep in mind the context of the time and, and pay attention closely to Douglass's actual words. Uh, he doesn't ever say that women don't deserve the right to vote. He simply says something more in the lines of, well, for all of us, it's a question of justice, but for blacks, it's literally a question of life and death. And therefore, they needed to push black suffrage at that time. Did uh, Douglas make any pronouncements about President Andrew Johnson? Uh, yeah, he had plenty. Uh, his first meeting with Andrew Johnson was, I believe, in 1865. He met with the black delegation. Um, and as we're talking about voting rights, that actually was what was essentially on the table. Uh, the Civil Rights Act was um, being considered in Congress at the time. Uh, and so uh, Frederick Douglass, along with other Blacks, they go and visit Andrew Johnson. Uh, and they ask him whether he would champion uh, Black suffrage. Uh, and they even try to, you know, appease him in some regards. Uh, they talk about how, you know, he was their Moses, uh, how he led them to the promised land and, uh, and the fight for the Civil War. And, and President Johnson sort of ate this up. Uh, but then when they bring up the idea of black suffrage, uh, the buck stopped there with President Johnson and he made clear to tell them uh, that they were simply asking for too much. And in fact, that they were ungrateful for all that uh, the white North had done for them. Uh, and and uh, there's this famous line where uh, uh, Douglas says at the very end, he's like, well, you send us to the people and to the people we will go. Uh, and he immediately starts writing again. And he's uh, at this point, um, very critical of Andrew Johnson. Um, and a lot of Republicans, if they weren't already critical of him, became increasingly critical of Andrew Johnson at this point. Um, great. Um, tell us what's next uh, in your uh, uh, career. I know you're getting ready to publish a book and are, are there other uh, books in the making? And uh, I know you're clerking for a judge now. What uh, what, do you, what uh, do you see ahead for you? Yeah, that's right. So uh, I'll be finished clerking uh, end of July, and uh, it's at that time that I'll uh, return to finishing up the book manuscript uh, on Frederick Douglass and understanding uh, how his constitutional thought influenced the antebellum era. Um, and I think that'll be uh, helpful for those who are really trying to understand how these arguments sort of formed, right? And where does Douglass fit in all of this. Um, and as far as future work, um, a lot of it I'm hoping to elucidate more fully uh, the sense of anti-slavery constitutionalism in the United States. Uh, I think it's helpful for us to see how they made these arguments. Uh, I mean, when you look at the Constitution itself, it has several provisions uh, that are remarkably pro-slavery. Um, so how could Frederick Douglass and other anti-slavery advocates possibly have read this Constitution to not only uh, not benefit slavery, but to be anti-slavery in nature, effectively meant to defeat slavery. Um, in some respects, I think this could actually help us today as we think of modern modes of constitutional interpretation. Uh, in fact, I have an article that will be out uh, very soon, will be published uh, called Frederick Douglass and the Original Originalists. Um, and I make the argument that Frederick Douglass and those interlocutors that he had at his time uh, were actually the first to sort of iterate this idea of returning to an original understanding of the Constitution, but they did it in a very different way than we see today. Um, they look at the history, but they never forget the founding principles upon which the nation was founded. This idea that all men truly are created equal and this idea that we do have natural rights and that all these things correspond to a natural law that's knowable uh, by all persons who are reasonable, uh, that's universal, and that has force in as much as we give it force through the positive law. Um, so my scholarship moving forward is understanding Douglas in this era, but then also sort of building out this idea of constitutional interpretation, how originalism and natural law, which uh, many scholars today would find are absolutely in contention to the point where at least a lot of originalists would say, no, we can't consider natural law. That's, some, that's beyond the purview of a judge. Um, and I think, well, if we return to how at least many jurists, uh, but also political, uh, prominent political figures understood the constitution in the antebellum era, it might not be so antithetical, right? There might be a world in which we can adhere to what, what's on paper, but also uh, adhere to this general sense 
uh, of a moral law that that is binding uh, on us all, and and we can intuit that through the constitutional provisions. He seems to have uh, been inspired and, and taken great um, hope from his time in England, um, as you were describing earlier on. Was there any one person or, or two there who had an a sort of influence on his uh, thinking and, and uh, really motivated him uh, on his return uh, to the United States to do what he did? Yeah, as far as from England, um, from what I found, he actually mostly pointed to his American mentors, but the one uh, writer that he uh, cited for at least helping him to rethink the nature of government, the nature of how governments ought to relate to human beings and the natural rights human beings have is George Cone. Uh, he's a Scottish Enlightenment thinker, uh, which is kind of interesting, right? It's, it's sort of different from your stereotypical Locke, like John Locke, Thomas mm -hmm. Hobbes, right, type understanding of a theory of a state of nature and the idea that, well, we get our precepts uh, or, or our initial premises of, of the legitimate uh, extent of government from them. Uh, and I think this is where Douglas starts to rethink the, the idea of the state of nature, to rethink human mm -hmm. beings' sociality. And so in that sense, um, for those who study political theory, you see a, a very classical uh, undertone to Douglas's modern theory of rights. Um, it's not just the sense that we're all isolated beings, right? Uh, and this he credited to George Combe and his time studying in England. And then as it relates to the constitution, a lot of uh, American writers such as William Goodell, Lysander Spooner, Garrett Smith, uh, and others in America that helped him sort of put two and two together. The idea of theory that he gained while he was in England and then how does it apply specifically to the Constitution from uh, some of his other uh, American friends? You're doing very important work and uh, we're very grateful and thank you very much uh, for your time this evening. Professor, it's been uh, um, enlightening and we're looking forward to the publication of your, of your work. Um, we want to thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule. We want to thank uh, Judge Bush uh, for uh, allowing you to um, participate and uh, letting you loose from a late night work uh, that clerkships are known for. <laughs> so we're grateful that you uh, and Judge Bush uh, have participated in the program tonight. Um, we have several more virtual programs coming up. Uh, next Wednesday, uh, February 21st at noon, uh, the Civics in American Democracy series resumes for a conversation I'll have with Judge D. Brooks Smith on the independent federal judiciary, a look back and a look forward. And on Thursday, March 2nd at 7 p.m., Professor Laura Kalman will uh, join us on Zoom to discuss her new book, FDR's Gambit, which is a fascinating look at the 19th 37 court packing plan. Registration for both these events are open and available on the society's website. Uh, coming on May 2nd for Law Day 2023, we will be hosting a Zoom lecture with Professor John McHale from Georgetown University Law Center for a talk on James Wilson and We the People and the preamble to the Constitution, uh, which Professor Ribeiro emphasized this evening, as a matter of fact. Uh, registration will be open uh, for that lecture on our website in just a few days. A reminder that a survey will go out tomorrow morning uh, to everyone who registered in advance. We do encourage you to respond to it. We want to make these programs as interesting and accessible to as many people as possible. And we're going to continue doing these virtually post-pandemic. Uh, we've uh, really enjoyed the success of these programs during the pandemic and expanding our outreach and uh, reaching more in, uh, individuals. And we appreciate your feedback and participation. Professor Ribeiro, thank you so much again for uh, your discussion this evening. It was very interesting. We thank you for joining us. And with that, we are adjourned. Okay, thank you. Thank you.